let us turn to the Lord God's word, to his commandments. They are life-giving, and we turn to Luke chapter 19. We are also going to read from verse 45 into chapter 20. So we are near the end of preaching through the gospel of Luke. Luke 19, verse 45. Jesus entered the temple and began to drive out those who were selling, saying to them, It is written... And my house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it a robber's den. And he was teaching daily in the temple, but the chief priests and the scribes and the leading men among the people were trying to destroy him, and they could not find anything that they might do, for all the people were hanging on to every word he said. On one of the days, while he was teaching the people in the temple and preaching the gospel, the chief priests and the scribes with the elders confronted him, and they spoke, saying to him, Tell us by what authority you are doing these things, or who is the one who gave you this authority? Jesus answered and said to them, I will also ask you a question, and you tell me. Was the baptism of John from heaven or from men? They reasoned among themselves, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say, Why did you not believe him? But if we say from men, all the people will stone us to death. For they are convinced that John was a prophet. So they answered that they did not know where it came from. And Jesus said to them, Nor will I tell you by what authority I do these things. Amen. Again, we have heard the word of God coming with authority the authority of God from heaven, from the lips of our Savior, the Son of God. And I pray that we will receive this word with the full authority that comes behind it. Congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, what does it do to a person as soon as he or she finally grasps that Jesus Christ really came and acted by the highest authority, by the authority of God Almighty. What does it do to you? Well, does it not drive you on your knees in awe before God? Did Christ's disciples grasp that? Did they know that all of his life on earth, the Lord did all which he did by the highest authority, the authority of the almighty and sovereign God? Did they know? Well, they confessed it. You see, Simon Peter once spoke on behalf of all the disciples when he said, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And of course, shortly before Christ ascended back to the Father into heaven, he plainly told them, all authority in heaven and on the earth has been given to me. All authority. And so, with their minds, the disciples grasped it. And with their mouths, they professed it. 
But do you know when they really lived it? Well, was it not on following upon Pentecost Day when our Lord Jesus, again, from above, by the highest authority, poured out, as he had promised, the Holy Spirit? And Peter, convinced of Christ's highest authority, started preaching boldly in that very city where the Lord had preached and in the face of the very same Jewish leaders from whom the scared, stiff disciples ran away only five weeks earlier. But now they're bold. Indeed, especially after our Lord's resurrection, ascension, and the outpouring of His Spirit, the disciples' actions showed that they had no doubt. They had no doubt by which authority He had performed His earthly ministry. And as a result, they served Him. And they obeyed His command to go and spread the gospel. And was it not the same with the Apostle Paul, who at first was an enemy of Jesus Christ, until, yes, until he too saw the risen Lord, and he fell on the ground, and he started serving Christ with every fiber in his being. Authority. See what it does to you when you grasp who Jesus really is and that he has the highest authority. That's what our passage is all about. That Jesus Christ holds the highest authority, but then it comes with a question. How do you and I respond to that? Our sermon has three points. Highest authority in action. Secondly, highest authority question. And thirdly, highest authority upheld. Firstly then, highest authority in action. It's about the year 30 AD, and it's four days only before the Jewish Passover. Yes, it's also four days before our Lord's crucifixion. Yes, our Lord Jesus was going to be crucified on the Friday. But now at the time of Luke 19, verse 45 to 48, it's still Monday. And Jesus has just arrived at the temple to teach. But what does he see? Well, anything but a worship atmosphere Indeed, it was more like the deafening noise at an auction or at a business hub, and that at the temple of all places. Yes, in the temple's outer court, the court, which God had allowed for foreigners and eunuchs to come and worship him. Why was it so busy? Well, because it's nearly Passover. <laughs> and many Jews have come from all over the known world, from Rome, from Greece, from Galatia, from Babylonia, from Persia, from Egypt and Arabia. They have come to celebrate Passover at the temple in Jerusalem and to offer animal sacrifices to God. And what is more convenient, what is more practical to bring your own sacrificial lamb with you all the way from Persia 
And then to see it rejected by the priest who finds some or other defect in it? Or to come with enough cash in your pocket and to come by an already approved lamb or a calf or a dove at the temple? What's more convenient? Of course, it's the latter. Come with cash. So there at the temple, you could buy animals, wine, oil, salt, and doves, all you might need for your sacrifices. What's more, you were not allowed to pay the required temple fees in your Roman currency, your Roman money. Now, if you came with Roman money, you had to come change that there at the temple into Hebrew shekels. And of this thing, you can be sure you will need to pay whatever fee the money changers charge you. And no doubt, much of their profits went into the coffers of Annas and Caiaphas, the high priests. So what do we see? Well, that instead of keeping the outer court free as a place for reverent worship for the foreigner and the eunuch, the priests and their officials had a booming business going there for themselves. It was anything but a quiet worship atmosphere. There was a deafening noise made by the animals, by the doves, by the buyers and sellers. And on top of that, there was the stench of animals that filled the air. And our Lord Jesus, well, he bursts into a holy anger. And according to Mark's gospel, and Mark says more about this than Luke, Jesus began to drive out out those who were sold and those who bought at the temple and he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons and he would not allow anyone to carry anything through the temple you want to say wow Jesus what are you doing these people will hate you for this but what a thorough cleansing. And then our Lord adds words to this. He says, it is written, my house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. So what do we see? Well, that Jesus is exactly saying what also the prophets Isaiah and Jeremiah once told God's people. Yes, Jeremiah once warned them when it was the temple of Solomon. You who have changed God's holy temple into a den of robbers, do you think God will forever tolerate you and tolerate this place? Do you want to see what God can do to this place of worship? Then go now and look at Shiloh, that former place of worship, Go see how it now lies in ruins and how thorns and thistles are growing there where God's place of worship once stood. So look, look and take it in. God is able to do the same with this wonderful temple standing at this place. My brother and sister, and God did. Not long after Jeremiah's warnings, God, through the Babylonians, destroyed that most glorious temple once built by Solomon. A temple that had become a place of insincere worship and idolatry. And God also destroyed the sinful priests and worshipers. So back to our text. What prophetic warning does Jesus' temple cleansing 
then now give? Well, a warning regarding this new temple, this glorious one built by Herod the Great, beautiful and big. A warning that would be fulfilled about 40 years later in 70 AD when God would bring the Romans to destroy that city and that temple and slaughter 1.1 million Jews. But Jesus' temple cleansing did not just serve as a prophecy. No, it also served as a messianic sign. As a look who has come into his temple sign. Why do I say that? Well, look, is the authority by which Christ cleanses this temple, is that not a fulfillment of the words our Lord once spoke in Matthew 12, verse 6? I tell you, something greater than the temple is here. And is this not also a fulfillment of Malachi 3, verse 1? Then suddenly the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come, says the Lord Almighty. But the Jewish leaders in Jesus' day did not click that. All they would perhaps accept was that when the prophets of old preached, they preached by the highest authority, the authority of God. But who is this unlearned Jesus of Nazareth who has not even studied theology at any training school? Well, as for the rest of that Monday, the Jewish leaders were afraid to do anything against Jesus because they feared the people. For the people loved Jesus and his teaching and his healings. But look at our Lord's calm and authoritative composure. Now that he has cleansed the outer court for proper worship, he goes and unafraid of the priests, as verse 47 says, he just continues in that same court as if nothing has happened to teach the people and to heal the blind and the lame. And they were hanging on his words. And the children, according to the Gospel of Mark and Matthew, the children kept on shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna to the son of David, which means, please save, please save us, son of David. So when our Lord had done what he in highest authority had planned for that Monday. Yes, when he had restored the temple's outer court for proper worship and had calmly finished his teaching and healing ministry for that Monday, then, as Matthew and Mark tell us, Jesus left the temple and he went out of Jerusalem to the east to Bethany where he spent the night. Which brings us to point two, highest authority question. The next morning, that is on the Tuesday, despite how he had upset the Jewish leaders the previous day, our Lord returned unafraid and with great authority back to the same temple to teach and to heal God's people. And as he was busy healing and teaching them, the Jewish leaders who were still angry about what he did on the previous day, yes, that same, those same leaders who would only three days later kill him, they came to him and asked him by what authority he did these things. And so they asked him as much as Jesus, show us your credentials. 
Yes, show us your certificate of study, your qualifications, so that we can see from which theological, theological training school you are and who has given you the authority to do what you have been doing. Yes, who do you think you are? Who gave you the authority to do what you did yesterday by hampering our temple business and then even quoting words from the respected prophets Isaiah and Jeremiah at us? By what authority did you do all these things? My brother and sister, how would you and I have wanted Jesus to answer them? See, Jesus did not always do and still does not always do things the way you and I would want him to do it. Do you and I think Christ would have done better if he had answered them this way? Dear Jewish leaders, you ask about my authority. Well, do you remember what happened 33 years ago when wise men came from the Far East? Surely some of you who lived then are still alive today, so you will know. Do you remember how God led them by a special star? Do you remember their question to Herod? Herod, where is he who has been born king of the Jews? And dear Jewish leaders, do you remember some, some 21 years ago when I was only 12 years old and sitting among you and asking you questions at the temple and you were amazed at my understanding and my answers? And do you remember three years ago when John the Baptist preached and baptized at the Jordan? Do you remember that John even baptized me? And then do you remember what happened as I came out of the water? Yes, how the Holy Spirit descended on me like a dove and my father's voice from heaven. Do you remember that? Surely some of you were there for you sent a delegation to John the Baptist. You must have heard that voice from heaven saying, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. And then when I healed that paralytic in Capernaum, and when I forgave him his sins, some of your law teachers were there. Did they not tell you what I did and said at that time? Here it is. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. I told that paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he did. Then a few weeks ago, when I was with my, with my disciples alone in the north at Caesarea Philippi, I asked them, but you, who do you say that I am? Then Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Then the Jewish leaders, on Sunday, yes, only two days ago, you saw me riding that donkey, and you saw the palm branches of royalty and victory, and you heard the crowd shouting the prophetic words of Psalm 118, Hosanna to the son of David. Can't you see? Are you blind? Can't you see that I have fulfilled the prophecy of Zechariah 9, verse 9? Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. 
See, your king comes to you, righteous and having salvation, gentle and riding on a donkey, a colt, the foal of a donkey. <laughs> so, dear Jewish leaders, can't you see that all authority in heaven and on earth has been given me? My brother and sister, that's not what our Lord said. Yet somehow, you and I wish he had said that. But he would not get into a dragged out discussion, trying to defend himself before men who just would not listen to even those words if Christ were to utter them. No, those leaders were hard of heart. They had seen and heard enough, but they would not listen. How about you and me? Do you and I grasp who Jesus is? But really, do we? Do you and I grasp with what authority Jesus of Nazareth came and taught and healed and died and rose and ascended back into heaven? Our Lord is not going to answer anyone in a petty human way, in an under the sun way. Because his ways are not our ways. You see, because of who he is, he rises above human thinking. That's his authority. So how would he answer those theologians and leaders who questioned his authority? Well, that brings us to the last point. Highest authority upheld. In typical Jewish fashion, Jesus did not answer those blind theologians with an answer. No, as so often when the Jewish leaders asked him a question, so also now our Lord answered them with a counter-question by which he puts them in a corner. This time, they have asked by what authority he was doing all these things. Then we hear our Lord say in verse 3, I also will ask you a question. Now tell me, was the baptism of John from heaven, was it by God's authority or was it of man? Did he just do it of his own bat? And of course... Our Lord knew exactly how they would discuss among themselves as to how they could possibly answer this hot potato. He, as Lord of heaven and earth, knew they would not be willing to admit that John the Baptist performed his ministry by the authority of God. For if they were to admit that, then Jesus would say to them, then why did you not believe, John, when he pointed at me and he said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. This is the one I meant when I said, A man who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. But Christ knew they would not admit that John ministered by the authority of God. And Christ also knew that they would not want to say that John administered by mere human authority, for if they dare say that, then they'd be in big trouble with the crowds who were convinced that John was a prophet from God. My brother and sister, a chess player would have said, Wow, Jesus has put those Jewish leaders in checkmate. He has cornered them. The only way they can get out of their mess 
is by giving an embarrassing answer like this. We don't know. We don't know by whose authority John was baptizing. And that's exactly what they did. So what does Jesus now say? Well, this. Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. This is a man of authority speaking. You feel like saying to Jesus, but Lord, why didn't you tell them exactly who you are? If you did, you could have saved your life. But as it is now, they think you're just an ordinary man. So they will now proceed with their schemes to kill you. Why did you not tell them straight out who you are and saved your life? Well, my brother and sister, you and I know our Lord was not going to try and escape death. After all, that's exactly what he came for. To willingly give his life for his loved ones. Besides, even if he had told those Jews straight out who he was, they would just do what they had done all along. Throw away his words as rubbish. So what did our Lord do? He gave them the same answer as he would give to everyone, also to you and I, if we were to refuse to submit to him. He gave them the final answer, an answer of closure, an answer that closes the door. So dear Wainui member and dear visitor, allow me to ask, how do you answer the question regarding Jesus' authority? Who is Jesus for you? Question we ask people who come to do profession of faith. Who is Jesus for you? I know who he is for me. My promised Savior the Messiah, the Son of the living God. I know that. By God's grace, I know that. If you too can say the same, then look. This is what our Lord will say to you. Blessed are you, dear Wainui member, dear visitor, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Amen.